Hello from the Snetterton 300 circuit and welcome to the highlights of the action from a selection of the 750 Motor Club's array of championships. Today the focus is firmly on sports cars with three separate categories providing the entertainment. The Spy Sports Cars Bike Sports Championship is the fastest of the club's offerings and this weekend's double header marks the halfway point in the season. Later we'll see a capacity grid of cars in the Protec Shocks Sports Specials Championship with the entry complemented by a contingent of sports racing and GT cars. But first the action comes from the Disclock RGB Championship which caters for motorcycle engine cars whether they are front or rear engined and it appeals to drivers who have interests beyond the on-track activity. Tony Gaunt's with me from the RGB Championship now. You've got your car here and I think you've done pretty much all of the work on this. It's all your own work, isn't it? Yes, it started on a bench in the garage uh, as pieces of steel and built up from there. Everything you see is uh, by my own fair hand, shall we say. <laughs> and it's just developed from there. And it's all done as, I understand, a single garage. I mean, how do you do that? It's a very single garage. Uh, I start to wonder when I look back, mm -hmm. but it's just something you get on with when you're interested and you make yeah. it work. Yeah. It's probably not ideal, but that's what you've got, so you deal with it. Absolutely. So, uh, and it's actually a car that, you know, it seems to me is going increasingly well. It's very good in certain places. Uh, we've got work to do in others, but yeah, it's, it's coming forward yeah. and uh, it's showing promise. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. The 750 Motor Club is people building the, their own cars mm -hmm. and, and trying to develop them. Mm -hmm. David Watson, one of the competitors in the front engine class of the uh, RGB Championship. You've been in the Championship for four years now, I think, David, and always in the front engine class. Is that right? That's absolutely correct, yep. Um, the car's been developed over the last four years from the Seven style car. Mm -hmm. This winter, we stripped it back and rebodied it with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, full body to hopefully help with a bit more aero to, uh, to try and get back up to the uh, front of Class F. And that does seem to be the way that the class as a whole is going now. It's a bit more about the full body work and the... You know the improved aerodynamics that, that brings. No, absolutely, and uh, it's been proven this year. I had a not particularly great season last mm -hmm. year um, with a lot of engine issues, but mm -hmm. this year so far it's been uh, it's been pretty good. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's slowly starting to creep back up to the front yeah. of Class F. Yeah. So it's definitely been advantageous to, to make that move. You found a bit of time, have you? At the circuit you've been to so far. Yeah, absolutely. Again, um, top end going down mm -hmm. going down the straights. Mm -hmm. uh, the aero's helping there, but also the increased. Uh, frontal area uh, is assisting a lot under braking as well so mm -hmm. it allows you to kind of close the gap a bit more under the corners. I guess within the uh, the front engine class you're not racing right at the sharp end of the field but usually the battling is just as good if not even more intense than in the, uh, the rear engine class. No absolutely and uh, I think class F is a, a fantastic kind of feeder class for, for class R and personally I certainly won't be uh, certainly won't be leaving class F until I've, uh, I've managed to, to win. The cars coming out onto the grid then for the first of two races today in the Disclock RGB Championship. John Cutmore and Matthew Higginson lining up on the front row of the grid with Scott Mittell and Alistair Bolton on row two. The best of the front engine cars on row five is going to be James Walker. So the red lights go on. Out they go. Good start by Matthew Higginson from the outside of the front row, but from row seven it's not a great start from Oliver Hewitt. Who for giving that then? It's his first ever race start. And he's out there in the Spire GT3. The rest of the field have got away quite nicely though. Hewitt unfortunately has dropped almost to the back in that uh, number 30 car for the 30 year old from Leicester, the photographer by occupation. He is going to have to make some places up from the back. I'm sure he'll enjoy that. Leaders have gone through. There you can see uh, James Walker in the first of the front engine cars, already ahead, I think, of uh, David Watson, I think that was, lining up in second. And there's Oliver Hewitt in that white and blue Spire uh, number 30, already trying to make up some ground. So we go on board now with Alistair Bolton, number four, former front engine class championship, fourth overall in the championship last season. He's got Higginson, number one, and Cutmore, number five, ahead of him on the road, all three of them in these Spire GT3s. The first non-Spire is the fourth place car, the Mattel MC52 of Scott Mattel. Back on board we go with uh, Oliver Hewitt. Recently passed his uh, art test and has not had too much time uh, testing this car before the opening round of the championship, so it's really a case of in at the deep end. It's the exit John Cutmore and more recently Jonathan Thackeray car. I've got no racing history at all, but already he's attacking the number 24 car there and trying to find a way through. That's Ed Scottney. 
as the leader Matthew Higginson makes his way down towards Brundtland Nelson for the first time there's Scott Mittal trying to make a move on uh, Al Bolton for what would be third position so Bolton it is in the number four car and uh, Mittal is the next car through which is number six as the cars now make their way down towards the bomb hole and then quorum curve for the first time we're getting into some of the front engine cars here there's James Walker just going through shot in the lead of that class and there is number 84 which is uh, Robert Gardner in another of the spires for the driver from Hyde in Greater Manchester as the leader goes over the line Higginson with Cutmore not too far behind him his teammate the blue car there in fifth place is Paul Rogers who is from just down the road in Attleburg the number 43 Contour David Whale coming through in sixth Duncan Haller is seventh place, the man from just outside Coventry. Here is Kelvin Walls, then number 21, the 59 year old from uh, Suffolk, a sign writer by occupation. Started racing in carts as a youngster back in the 1960s. Oh, he loses one or two places there. That's the 39 car of Mark Norton, the British Touring Car Championship racer, uh, forging away through in the MNR GM4. And so Kelvin Walls, in the uh, AP Performance Sabre, goes back down a position there the car that appeared on the uh, Dragon's Den with Andy Bates of AB Performance a few years ago. And this driver, Kelvin Rawls, has been racing with the 750 Motor Club since 1977 and he sees Mark Norton go wide there. And a car that's uh, continuing to be developed this season. As back with the leaders, Higginson continues to lead then. He's won three out of the four races that have taken place so far this year as the reigning champion, Matt Higginson, the one he missed out on was the second one at Donington Park where you may remember he stalled on the grid but he won one at Donington Park and two at Silverstone on the lateral circuit which was the last outing for these cars Cutmore who's just behind him here got himself into some good positions in the races at Silverstone but three moments during the course of the two races over the weekend that cost him dear there as Oliver Hewitt is coming through the field just behind there the uh, number 11 MNR GM2 of Stephen Mallion on board with him we go a good view we get from uh, just up on the roll cage behind the driver's helmet. Up towards Murray's they go, the left-hander. <laughs> and Stuart working away at the wheel there. You can see the uh, paddle shift type uh, gear selection system on the steering wheel. So here is that number 21 car of Kelvin Rawls, just ahead of uh, Robert Gardner. And I think uh, that's is that David Watson. No, that's the X39 car, isn't it? Uh, for Mark Lord just behind. So here is uh, Rawls then. Started racing the 750 Formula initially. Raced the Wolf a couple of seasons ago, the Wolf 01. So there is Norden who is heading into the pit lane. So Mark Norden looks to be out of the race. We'll go back to uh, Alistair Bolton now. A bit of daylight ahead of him on the track as locking up ahead of him is Matthew Higginson. Uh, Agostini Henny loses the lead of the race because of that, so Cutmore goes through. And does Bolton make it through to second? Yes, he does. So Higginson down to third place as Mark Norton rejoins the circuit in uh, number 39 then. A quick pit stop for him. There's a green flag there, which means there must be a yellow flag somewhere else, just before it. Someone having gone off the circuit. On board with Bolton and Scott Mittell now that goes through. And that's going to be up into second position indeed. What a great run this is for the Mittell MC52. Car that primarily Scott's dad, but a little bit of it's got himself. But Scott's father, Ian Mittell, has put an awful lot of work into designing and building and developing and re-engineering this car. It's a new car for this season. And it's certainly a step forward on last season's model. Well, 84, Robert Gardner there through on the inside of 21. Uh, Kelvin Rawls trying to fight back though. It is Rawls now though. And at the rear of that little group is our Class F, F for front engine leader, which is James Walker. He won the second of the two races at Silverstone. So has had uh, one win this season, so has Steve Bell, who's not made it out for this race, unfortunately. Paul Rick has won both races in the front engine class at Donington, but he's uh, missing this weekend. Uh, engine problems, unfortunately, I think, preventing him from being here. Last lap board has gone out. 
and John Cutsmore it is in the number five car that leads. He's been around and about the RGB Championship for quite a few seasons now. Yet to win the overall championship though, and that's something that he'd dearly love to do. But Higginson, his teammate who won the championship last season, well, he's going to make life very tough for him as this battle rages on. Rawls and Gardner, and they're being hassled by the front engine car of uh, James Walker as well, number 13. The Phoenix, engineered by Tim Gray Motorsport. And I think that car is one that's really stepped forward as well this season. He's not got too much in the way of front engine opposition in this race as Gardner goes through on the inside of Rawls. Well, this is a good scrap that these two are having. It's further back down the order towards the bottom end of the top ten. And look at the time that Mittal has taken out of John Cutmore. He's right in the toe now and he's going to draw alongside. Under the vehicle bridge they go. Can Mattel have a go? He's going to get halfway alongside. Let's have a look down the inside into the right-hander. And there's contact. And off onto the grass goes Scott Mattel. I think Cutmore's off and through into the lead goes Alistair Bolton. Bolton, who had two victories during the course of 2013. Pounds is there to take the lead of the race. Second is Cutmore, third is Mattel, and fourth is Higginson now. They're right together. What a conclusion to this Disclock RGB Championship race. But it looks like Bolton's going to win it now. The number four car is heading home, and it's side by side for third position. Higginson and Mattel in number six. Higginson in number one. They are absolutely alongside one another as they go across the line, but Bolton wins here at Snetterton from John Cutmore. And then third place went the way of Scott Mittell in the end, but a, a controversial end to that race with a bit of contact between the two race leaders up there at Nelson. It looked a little bit of a racing incident to me, but I'm sure each driver will have their own view of the situation. That's coming through to take ninth place in the end comes Robert Gardner just ahead of Kelvin Walls, and then in 11th place, the first of the front engine cars, by quite some margin actually, is James Walker. Uh, there's David Watson who comes across the line in second. And more dramas, I'm afraid, at the end of the race for number 39, Mark Norden. Confirmation of the result then. Bolton winning by a second, but just nine one hundredths separated Mittel and Higginson in their battle for the final podium position. Further back, Duncan Hall was seventh, Tony Gaunt eighth. Confirmation that Gardner beat Rawls to the penultimate place in the top ten. Al, uh, I guess you're in the right place at the right time as far as that race was concerned. Yeah, that's right. They never give up. I didn't. I just couldn't believe it as I came onto the last lap. I was running third for most of the race, uh -huh. and then I think Matt Ape to himself along with John. He was off onto the grass, and I was there. Couldn't get it back, so I ran second for a bit. Then I missed the gear onto the back straight. Scott got me. Pretty uh -huh. good move. And I just chased and chased. They were pulling away a little bit. Saw Matt in my mirrors. Managed to stay ahead, and then they just sort of kind of coming together on the last lap at the S's. And I just saw my space and went. Fantastic. <laughs> and I guess after a bit of disappointment in the first couple of meetings, it's a really good way to get your championship back on track. Yeah, Donington, it's kind of mistakes down to me. Silverstone, it was me and the car. <laughs> so it was just good to come back. And I just wanted to finish a race and I ended up winning, so I'm dead chuffed. <laughs> OK, James, uh, another win in the front engine class. You must be very pleased with how it's going. Oh, I'm enormously pleased, yeah. I mean, a, a huge thanks to uh, Tim Gray for building me in a fantastic car, which is uh, obviously now a class leader. And uh, I did what I was told. I stayed out of trouble. I didn't get involved too much with the... Uh, with the rear engine car battle and uh, uh, just uh, very yeah very actually very quite easy in the end I managed to stay in front and uh, and uh, come in uh, in the lead so uh, it was great fun. Do you like to have a little bit more of a battle though with someone with someone else in your class? I, I would very much yeah I'm really really disappointed that uh, Steve Bell uh, didn't make it to the race uh, today and uh, hopefully maybe he'll be back in this afternoon but uh, um, it'd be nice to have a, a bit of a fight but uh, as it is I'll take the win thanks very much. <laughs> Excellent thank you. So Patrick, uh, coordinator for the MR2s here at Snetterton, but uh, you've got your race suit on today, why is that? Well I actually race in the uh, Sports Specials Championship with the, the 750 Motor Club in a kit car derived from uh, originally Toyota MR2 running gear. And so tell us a little bit about the car that you're racing then this weekend. Well this is, uh, we, we call it a, a Xenon um, and uh, it uses the 
drivetrain, uh, actually now from a Toyota Corolla, mm -hmm. uh, which is the same engine that's in the Lotus Elise and Lotus mm -hmm. Exige. Mm -hmm. um, but originally we started with the Toyota MR2 Roadster engine, mm -hmm. so we share the brakes and the, um, the running gear and uh, the steering column and quite a few other parts. And so how, how well does it go within that Sport Specials Championship then? We're doing okay. Uh, we, we're still developing the car at the moment. We've got a few bits and pieces that we need to sort out. We're a little bit below the power of the other cars, but we, we know the reasons for that. And we know it's just a case of us sorting it out. Um, Brands Hatch, the last round, actually managed to, uh, to lead a race for a lap from starting fifth. But uh, once the other cars, once uh, the more powerful cars worked their way through the grid, there was nothing I could do to hold on to that, really. John Moore, you're here with the uh, FRS Arrow, which is a new car for the Sports Specials Championship this season. Just tell us a little bit about it. Um, it's a the car that I've designed from scratch and the intention is to make it um, a standalone formula with uh, a relatively affordable cost and not requiring exotic engineering skills to put it together. So we're selling uh, a kit of parts which is pretty comprehensive mm -hmm. um, for £12,000 mm -hmm. and you need a donor fiesta uh, for some of the parts that it uses to finish the build. Other than that you just need odds and sods, nuts and bolts, and you will have a race designed car. Mm -hmm. um, and so far we've been out at one race, but we've been out to a lot of track testing mm -hmm. and the performance has been very satisfying. It's yes. predictable, um, it's, not, it's got no quirks, nothing's broken so far. Um, and so as a prototype, we're yes. very happy with this. And the second car is now being built. Yeah. There's two races today for the Protec Shocks Sports Specials Championship and with the cars from the SR and GT Challenge joining in as well, it's a very full grid. 42 cars took part in qualifying. The fastest of those was Eddie Ives in the Elite Pulse that lines up on pole position. And next to him is going to be Clive Hudson in car number two. The first of the eclipses, Paul Boyd is on row two with Paul Collingwood next to him. Red lights are on, it's a long haul though. A little bit too long I think for the liking of some. The lights go out now, a dreadful start from Paul Boyd from the second row of the grid, but look at this, an absolutely flying start from Patrick Mortel from row seven of the grid. He's made up several places already. Around the outside he will go into Rich's corner for the first time. There is Paul Boyd who is about five rows ahead of him on the grid. I think he's just about past him now. And you can see the great variety we have on this grid because the number 73 car of Mark Bowd is a Ford GT40 replica, one of the SR and GT cars, but we'll focus mainly on the sport specials during the course of this race. And there are three classes for the Ford Duratec 2 litre cars, the uh, 1800cc Ford Z-Tech cars in Class B and Class C covers just about anything else, providing its power to weight ratio is no more than 340 brake horsepower per tonne. We're on board here with uh, Alan Robson in one of the MEV MX150Rs and uh, one driver out of the race already, I'm afraid, that looks to be Peter Samuels in his MGB GT V8. On board we go then with Patrick Mortel. Yes, there is the number three car of Paul Boyd, who was third in the championship last year in the Eclipse, as Mortel goes wide over the grass. Well, some of the good work of that great start has been undone because through flashes John Moore in the FRS Arrow, the green and yellow car, and also Nigel Brown, one of the great stalwarts of the sports specials and previously the kit car championship. And here's uh, number six car, which is the silver phaser. Number 32 going through. That is uh, Paul Cooper, the man from Cannock, in his raw striker. As the leader of the race is not actually Eddie Ives at the moment, because a bit further up the road, there he is, is Clive Hudson. Uh, Eddie Ives in second place. We saw him creeping on the start line a little bit there, um, but it was quite a long hold. Paul Collingwood is there in third. In fourth place, it's the Ariel Atom, which is uh, Nick Holden. Then David Caldercott is next through, and then it's Paul Boyd, who has some work to do after that poor start. The green car you can see there as well is the Tiger R10 of Gary Davison. So there's a mixture of cars here, some of them in Class A, some of them in Class C. And Class C drivers aren't actually eligible for the overall championship title, just Class A's A and B that uh, can contend for that. The, re the reason being that Class C is a bit of a catch-all, so uh, uh, just about anything goes. There's a great variety of machinery in that class, including this one, which is the number 11 car, the Arrow of John Moore with its uh, Ford Fiesta power plant, as we're hearing from uh, John before the race all about that. So it looks like Paul Boyd has made up one place. He's got ahead of a former Eclipse driver, as it happens. That's David Caldercourt switching to the Caterham 7 for this weekend as the uh, MX150Rs, a whole batch of them, uh, go across the line with their 
somewhat idiosyncratic styling. These cars with the MX-5 running gear, of course. I think we've got nine of them out here uh, this weekend. They used to have their own uh, standalone series, but uh, good to have them joining us. A side-by-side -side for the lead of the race. It looked like Eddie Ives was going through there to take the lead of the race away from uh, Clive Hudson in the bronze car. Meanwhile, we go on board with Nick Holden now, and we're looking ahead to see Paul Boyd, who's still got quite a bit of ground to make up, hasn't he, if he's going to uh, get on to terms with the leaders. Boyd, oh, and a spin, and that is the number 27, Cyana MX500R, which is David Roberts, the driver from North Ferriby. Here's Patrick Mortel then, on his recovery drive, and it's another Cyana that's ahead of us, so that must be number seven. Anton Landon, the driver from Cheshire. And Mortel carries an awful lot of speed through there. This is in towards the left-hander at Murray's. Landon gets a little bit out of shape, and that's going to allow Patrick Mortel to get alongside as they come on to the uh, centre straight then, past the pit lane entrance. And I think Patrick Mortel is going to make it through there. This is happening just outside the top ten at the moment. There's the number 44 Silver Phoenix of Marcus Roskill, who was the Class B winner in the second round of the championship at Browns Hatch. Victory in Class B in round one went the way of uh, Adrian Cooper. It's not been a happy start to the year for the defending champion from uh, Class B, Colin Benham, who was the number one on his car uh, this season. Look has not gone his way thus far in 2014. But Roskill there with uh, Leighton Norris in the Zenon just behind him. And then there's a gaggle of the SR and GT cars, including number 35, which is uh, Andrew Chalmers in the Ram Cobra for the drive from East Grinstead. You'll see that the, uh, some of the SR and GT cars like that Cobra replica. They're very effective in a straight line. As I think uh, Leighton Norris and Marcus Roskill are about to discover they're a little bit less wieldy through the corners, though. But nevertheless, Chalmers just make up a couple of positions there with the uh, raw grunt from that 6.7 litre engine. Now, here's a couple of the MX 150Rs doing the battle. I think these are the first two of them in actual fact. Down in something like 18th and 19th position, number 75, Kevin Dengate, ahead of number 76, which is Chris Lovett. On to the last lap we go then. Nick Holden. He is doing battle with David Caldercourt here for what is now fourth and fifth position because we have lost uh, Eddie Ives into the pit lane. He has retired. I don't know why. Possibly some damage to that car, but this is the scrap then for fourth and fifth places. Holden and Caldercourt, they've lapped there for the number 47 car of John Potter. You can see the Mev X 150R. Still side by side in this scrap for fourth. Nick Holden in the aerial atom on the inside. The exoskeleton type arrangement on that car compared to the more conventional Lotus 7 styling of the Caterham of Court to Court. A drive that went well uh, in Class B a couple of seasons ago. And there is our race leader. So on the last lap, Paul Boyd has managed to get through into the lead of this race. And he's going to see the chequered flag waved now. So Paul Boyd takes the win from Clive Hudson in second place. Here's the scrap for fourth going on. The third place man, Paul Collingwood, crosses the line now, but who's going to be fourth? I think it's going to be Nick Holden that manages to hold on in the aerial atom just ahead of uh, David Caldercourt there in number 34 for the man from Northampton. Confirmation of that result then. A great uh, end to the race for Paul Boyd. He set the fastest lap, a new lap record on the way to beat his teammate Clive Hudson with Paul Collingwood in third position. Further back down the order, Nigel Brown was seventh, John Moore eighth, Stephen Ward ninth and Anton Landon tenth. The best of the Class B cars was Paul Cooper in 13th. OK, Paul, uh, well done. Congratulations on that win. Uh, you really found some pace during the course of that one. I did. It's fabulous. First time here on the 300. So practice was the first opportunity to try that out. And so in the race, it came good. And uh, a bad start, which meant we yeah, had to play a bit of catch up. Yeah. It was good. You got Ed ahead of you and Clive as well. Ed retired and then you managed to close that gap to Clive, didn't you? I did. Ed was my target. So when he went off, that was a shame because I was going to learn the circuit from him. So <laughs> quite gutting, but yeah. Followed Clive and eventually got past him. Absolutely, I mean it's something like three seconds faster, I think, in the in the race compared to this morning. So is that really just a function of you learning the track? It's a function of me learning the track. Yeah, yeah fantastic. And the car seems to be going really well now. Both of the eclipses at the front. Car is good. Very predictable. Very easy to drive, mm -hmm. especially when you're trying to learn something. So yeah, yeah great fun. Excellent, wonderful. <laughs> Okay, 
okay, so Gary Baxter here in the Bike Sports Championship, but you've, you've got quite an interesting racing background, you were telling me. Yeah, we um, started racing back when I was like 17 on the motorcycles here, motorcycles really, on the 125 Grand Prix, mm -hmm. and then moved after a few years to 250s. Um, and then we ended up on, uh, ended up going through the 600 categories really in British Supersport and everything. And so, so then you obviously switched to cars at, uh, at one point, what was the reason for that? Um, mainly because um, it gets to the point of financial in the end, um, but then also it's sort of like you get to the point where you just start thinking your life change, you know, everything, commit commitments change a bit. And you just think, well, you know, life takes a different path. Yeah. And um, we, you know, we look down the route really of the cars of the bike sports really with the radicals and that because it still had the bike engines in and you know the pace of what they run out with all the downforce appealed really more than anything because you're still running at good lap times, so like used on the bike. So it's um, it sort of like drove you that direction really, knowing that it's got the bike back, you know, the bike bike side of it really with it. Well, Adrian, you're back out in the Bike Sports Championship again this season, but it's the, the Radical that you're in this year. Yes, um, I spent four years uh, racing my own car, mm -hmm. but it was getting four years old and uh, everything I had to replace, I had to build and manufacture myself, and it was just getting too much of a um, time spent mm -hmm. on it. So I went the easy option and bought a Radical, and it uh, seems to be going very well. Absolutely. I mean, the Radical obviously is the, the car of choice in bike sports. That's a testament to the uh, efforts that that particular company has put into developing these cars, isn't it? Yes, and you know, uh, I actually blew an engine up last night, and within three hours, I had a new oil cooler delivered because mine was possibly full of muck. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's, that's the sort of service that is it en enables you to race, and it enables me to be here today to enjoy it, rather than packing up and going home last night and thinking about six weeks worth of work to. To, to do bits and pieces absolutely and I guess you know there must still be an attraction to you for you to come out and race to still be coming out to do the bike sports in the radical this year it's probably an addiction rather <laughs> than an attraction I, I last raced really in 1979 yes. and then suppressed my career uh, while I built the, the racing car company um, so I guess there was some germ still there mm -hmm. and uh, as, as I have a bit more time these days uh, I'm enjoying coming back to the club scene mm -hmm. and looking back on my own career the club racing scene in Formula Ford and Formula Ford 2000 was probably some of the most rewarding mm -hmm. uh, and fun times I had. It all got a bit serious after that. The cars on the grid for the first of the races for the Spire Sports Cars Bike Sports Championship it's Tim Gray in the Spire that lines up on pole position Will Brown in the Radical PR6 is next to him. On the second row, it's Richard Wise in the Spire and Elliot Goodman in another Radical. As the race gets underway and the field heads down towards Richard's corner for the first time. And a fantastic noise these motorcycle engines make as they roar away from the line and up towards Richard's the first corner of this three mile lap then. Not the biggest grid of the bike sports cars that we have this weekend, but you can see that it is Tim Gray that leads the way at Montreal Hairpin. I think it is uh, Will Brown there in second position as the field makes its way through with bringing up the rear the number 68 car, which is Martin Phillipson, the uh, consultant electrical engineer from Siren Sester. But Tim Gray, well, no surprise that he is leading the way, really. There you can see in third place the blue and orange almost golf liveried car of Adrian Reynard as he makes his way down towards the right hander then these cars very fast in qualifying well underneath the two minute barrier for Tim Gray a one minute 51.91 in practice this morning so we'll expect to see very similar lap times during the race it's the first time that the bike sports cars have raced on this 300 circuit uh, last year they raced on the 200 layout Brown you can see in second place then third is uh, Adrian Reynard you can see a bit of a scrap developing for uh, fifth and sixth positions that's Richard Wise who has dropped back a little bit off the start trying to uh, find a way through there possibly that's ahead of the uh, Bob Scanlon uh, car that has made quite a decent start to the race Reynard then in the blue and orange car the Radical SR3 turning his way out of Murray's and up towards the start and finish line to complete the opening lap of this race, which is uh, being led by Tim Gray in the Spire. Oh, in a moment there, that's for number 35 going off the circuit. 
And that's uh, Mike Simpson, who started right towards the back of the grid. He rejoins the track now, though, having lost a little bit of time. And here's a bit of a scrap going on at the rear of the group. You can see the number 77 car, which is Gary Baxter now. He started fifth on the grid, so he's lost quite a bit of ground at the beginning of this race. He'll be keen to try and make some of that up. The man from uh, Bourne in Lincolnshire. Down at Agassini is that scrap, which is headed uh, at the moment by Tim Porter, I think that is, in the uh, 53 car. Dick Carter is involved in that battle as well. Making their way through the left-hander at Hamilton and down towards Oggies. There's Reynard then. He's in third position. As the cars make their way along the straight, it uh, looks like Goodman there in fourth. And he tries to find a way through ahead of Reynard and he does so but runs wide coming out of Nelson. But can Goodman in the number 28 car make that stick? Yes, he can. So Goodman goes up to third place now. Down to fourth goes Adrian Reynard. And he's made such a big contribution to race car design down the years. And Gary Baxter doing battle with Doug Carter here. Through Murray as they go, using a little bit of the kerb as they apex the corner. The majority of this field, of course, comprises radicals with just the two spires the GT3s of Tim Gray that runs in class B and uh, Richard Wise in class C uh, interrupting the monotony possibly not the right word because we love to see the radicals out here the PR6s and the SR3s and also the SR4 model represented in the hands of uh, Oliver Cox we'll have a look out for Oliver can see if we can spot him uh, a little bit later on during the course of this race Peterborough built cars and what has not been around for much more than about 15 years but very successful it's been it's revolutionized uh, sports car racing in many ways and now uh, many different types of radicals from the SR1 for the newcomers to race up to the mighty SR8s and a few more besides as we watch Richard Wise and the Spire which runs in Class C for the smaller capacity cars. That's the class that Tim Gray ran in last season. He's now running in Class B with a larger and more powerful engine, and it served him well because he's running away at the front of the field as we watch Adrian Reynard there trying to hold on to fourth position. Non-starter, by the way, in this race after engine problems in qualifying has been James Brakel, which has been a shame because he was on the podium for three of the first four races in the championship at Donington Park and Silverstone. This is round five of 12 in this particular championship as we watch uh, Doug Carter go through number 50 the 57 year old civil engineer from Kendall in Cumbria he's been racing in bike sports in the Radical Clubman's Cup for, for three years race for RG racing RGB before that as we watch Reynard run wide kicks up a bit of dust and that gives uh, heart to the drivers that are following him So Tim Porter there is in number 53. Just behind him is Gary Baxter. Just behind both of them is Richard Wise. Tim Porter, 53, who had a, a class victory in the previous meeting at Silverstone. Stephen Burgess won class A in both of the first two races at Donington Park, but Porter and Reynard split them at Silverstone last time out. Class B, though, generally seems to be the one where the pace is set, despite it not being the, the top class, in theory. Driving standards going, flag going out to somebody there. And it's for car number 29, which is Adrian Reynard. Well, experienced campaigner who was successful racing in his own right in the late 1970s. I think might have been uh, taking one or two liberties with the track limits here at Snetterton. And uh, cutting those white lines, oh, and that's bad fortune for Gary Baxter, number 77. He didn't have a very good start to this race, but it was getting better. And now he's spun up at Montreal as going through there is the number 38 car of Gary Patton. He gets ahead of Bob Scanlon now, and that puts him up into the top 10 for the first time in this race. As Tim Gray makes his way out of Murray's for the final time. We've not seen a lot of him, but 
truth be told, he's just run away and hid in this race. Checkered flag goes out. It's a third win in the row for Tim Gray as someone is struggling to get back onto track there. I think that's Kelvin Kingsley in the SR3. Yes, it is. So he loses a place uh, towards the end of the race to Bob Scanlon, therefore. Kingsley with that spin, the novice cross you can see on the back of his car. There goes our second place man, which is Will Brown. But uh, it's all waves and no doubt smart under the helmet for Tim Gray, the former RGB low cost and bike sports champion. And here's the confirmation. He's winning margin in the end, 27.92 seconds. Another 16 seconds back in third place was Elliot Goodman. But Richard Wise won his class in fourth place overall. Despite that late, late spin, Gary Baxter still finished seventh, the head of Adrian Reynard in the end, with Oliver Cox flying the flag for the SR4 in ninth. Well, Tim, you've won a game in bike sports that time by almost half a minute. You must be absolutely delighted with that. Yeah, really happy. Um, it, it's a shame, really, that JP wasn't here for it, to give me a race, because I think we'd have had a great race. But no, I mean, the car was fantastic. Um, I, I had to just get in a rhythm and just keep doing that, because I didn't want to... I saw... I knew I had a good gap, but... <laughs> As soon as you start slowing down, you start making silly mistakes and that kind of thing. So I just thought, I'm sticking to a lap time, I'm just going to keep doing that. Yeah. You know, lap, 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 perfect. So, yeah. yeah, really happy. You weren't quite as fast in the race as you were in qualifying. Was that a deliberate policy? Was that down to the changing conditions? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of thought, once I got off the line and I got in front and I saw I had a decent gap at the end of the first lap, I just, I knew what, what lap time I was going to pick to do as an average. Mm -hmm. I just thought, just keep sticking to do that. Do that every lap, every lap. I won't make a mistake and I just, you know, stick at my pace. And that's what I did. Well, Brown, second position. Are you pleased with that? Absolutely. Um, it's been a sort of a long weekend for me um, already. Um, we had a good test day here last week, um, good qualifying, and started in second and finished in second. Happy with that, yeah. Yeah, are you pleased sort of with that overall position in the order? Because it seems to be a step up for you. Ab absolutely, yeah. It's sort of my best result so far of the year. Um, and, I mean, Tim was just, just gone, so uh, to finish second, very happy, yeah. Right, Elliot, third place. Tell us about your race. Uh, well, starting fourth, obviously got a good start for grid up to third, and then outbreak myself a little bit into the hairpin, uh, can't remember what it's called, but um, Brainard got past, so I stood behind him for a lap or two, but eventually got back past and just managed to drive to the flag. And are you enjoying your racing so far this season? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's been good, yeah. First year in SR3, so, but it's been good fun. Excellent. And what do you make of the 300 circuit? Yeah, it's a good track. I don't like um, coming back the last complexes, but it's difficult as. But yeah, it's a good track overall. Second race of the day for the Disclock RGB Championship. Pole position goes to John Cutmore. With the race one went up, Al Bolton alongside him on the grid. Second row is Mattel and Higginson. Best of the front engine cars again is James Walker. But two rows behind him, Steve Bell has made it onto the grid this time in the Aryan. Red lights are on then, they go out. And we're underway here at Snetterton. And Paul Rogers there trying to find a gap that isn't quite there between the car in front and the uh, pit wall, so I think he has to back out of that one a little bit. Can Bolton get into the lead? Yes, he can from around the outside, on the outside of row number two, and uh, a good start in the front engine class has been made, I think, by uh, Steve Bell, because I think already he's got ahead of James Walker there. Around Montreal they go for the first time then, mainly Spires, but you've got the Mattel MC52, and the contour mixed in right at the sharp end of the field as well, and a bit more variety the further you go down the uh, rear of the order as well, especially into the front engine class, a few different uh, shapes and sizes of car there. Look at this there, a great lead for Alistair Bolton, former stock catch racer already. Uh, down to the left-hander at Agostini with a few car lengths in hand over Cutmore, no, it's Higginson, I beg your pardon, in second place, Cutmore third, Scott Mattel in fourth, but the 40-year-old from Shooksbury, software engineer Al Bolton, leads the race in the Spire GT3 with the Honda CPR 1000 engine. He leads the way then. It's the uh, X Matt Green Spire that is raced by uh, Al. It's also one that famously won a bike sports race at Anglesey a couple of years ago in the hands of the fantastic Tim Gray. So top four with uh, Mittel, the rear gunner in that group. 
heading down towards Brundtland Nelson for the first time and Cutmore and Mittal get close into Brundle, not as close as they did on the last lap of race number one however which is uh, probably just as well because that ended up in contact and it gifted the win to uh, Alistair Bolton on that occasion looks like Duncan Hall or there is uh, in fifth or sixth position and there's the class F battle that just went through short quite quickly there and it did look to me as if it was Steve Bell ahead of James Walker to Murray's then for the first time Higginson second cut more third and Mittal in fourth but already you can see by all of that that Alistair Bolton is pulling away in the lead of this race Mittal at the rear of the group a double uh, low cost champion, sh champion a few years ago switching to RGB what three seasons ago now it's really been uh, an exciting development project for Scott and his father. And it's good to see them taking on the Spires and Mittel goes through into third place there. Down the inside of Cutmore at the Montreal hairpin. Nice clean move that from Scott Mittel. Oliver Hewitt I'm afraid looks as if he's heading into the pits at the end of his first lap. So uh, although Oliver did make it to the end of race one in a very credible 14th position his second race is going to be a non-finish. So Mittel third, Cutmore fourth. They've just lost a little bit of ground though to uh, Matt Higginson, who came into this round of the championship uh, in the lead in Class R. But James Walker was leading the Class F and the overall championship with 51 points. Matt had uh, 50, so very tight indeed and a long way to go. We've had five races in the championship now and there's nine to go. And there is uh, Duncan Horlaw in fifth place, just ahead of Paul Rogers in sixth. Paul who had to back out really at the start to avoid getting squeezed into the pit wall. David Whale it is in the yellow and black spire that goes through in seventh position. Duncan Horlaw there in only his second season of racing. Paul Rogers more experienced though, <laughs> but goes wide, just as I'm commenting on how experienced he is. So he knows the Sneston circuit well, it's only just up the road for him. So no doubt he's probably more familiar with it than most of the other drivers out there. New bodywork for that car of Paul Rogers for this season. Our start line marshal has spotted something that needed picking up off the track. Now there is our front engine class leader. Now Steve Bell, I'm not quite sure why he wasn't out in the first race in the uh, Arian, but he's there now and he's got Robert Gardner between himself and his uh, front engine class rival which is James Walker who's won two of the five races uh, so far this season James Walker the 49 year old from uh, Datchet in Berkshire a chartered surveyor uh, by occupation he's a director with one of the major London based house builders he has a Suzuki powered uh, Timbre Motorsport Phoenix that's the car right there number 13 for the driver that started racing in RG Beach about a decade ago now He's had uh, class wins at Mallory Park in the past. His nephew is Oliver Bryant, the uh, professional driver in the British GT Championship, also often to be seen in historic racing as well. Ooh, and that's a big lock up there for Matt Higginson. And it allows John Cutmore to go through up into third position. So we've got Bolton leading, Mittal second now, and Cutmore third and Higginson down to fourth place. I think Walker is getting a bit closer to Steve Bell now. They're both behind Robert Gardner in that uh, number 84 car, the Spire GT3. But our front engine uh, contingent are together as off goes the next car in that group. And that's Adrian Moore, isn't it? Number 68, I'm afraid to say, has clattered the barriers there. The uh, AB Sabre for the driver from Peterborough. And so he looks to be out of the race, I'm afraid. Running Oliver Hewitt on the retirement list as the last lap board now is displayed to the leaders as they go through. Paul Rogers has made it up ahead of uh, Duncan Haller now, and David Whale in the Spire is trying to do the same. Both of them in the Spire GT3s, the cars built by Paul Nightingale's Derbyshire based concern, which really have become the car to have in the rear engine class. But there's a, a big impetus now to try and push the front engine to division as well. We're seeing very good racing actually in both divisions this season. <laughs> and here is evidence of that because it's Bell and Walker almost nose to tail as they went through Murray's that time. It's about two car lengths as they 
come off the corner now, up the straight they go. I think Walker's close enough to pick up a toe from Steve Bell's car. He's going to go to the left-hand side of the circuit now. He's going to draw alongside as they head up towards Richie's corner. This is uh, just outside the top ten at the moment, but it's the battle, more importantly, for the leading Class F. Points are scored within each individual class. So it's not the overall finishing position that matters, it's how you do within your class. And Steve Bell at the moment is on course to take maximum points as far as Class F is concerned. James Walker's doing everything he can to try and change that Walker who won race number one as far as the front engine class was concerned. As far as the rear engine class is concerned, it looks like it's going to be two wins today for Alistair Bolton, doesn't it? If it had gone another lap or so this, I think Scott Mattel might have caught him because we saw Scott come on really strongly towards the end of the uh, first race, whether his car is just set up so maybe it looks after the tyres a bit more and it, it comes into its own later in the race, I don't know, but he's been catching Al Bolton here in these last couple of laps, but John Cutmore is setting a great pace as well and he's had a very good last lap to get back onto the tail of Scott Mattel Higginson. Looks like he's going to finish in fourth place, but the chequered flag goes out. Two wins today for Al Bolton. Mattel second and Cutmore third, and there's barely a second covering the first three cars. In the background now, you can see Higginson uh, crossing the line in fourth position. But uh, a good race, that. And good to see Al Bolton having his second win of the season, already matching his tally from 2013. They're still at it in the front engine class. James Walker, number 13, just behind the number 86 car of Steve Bell. Opportunities running out, though. Oh, he's going to have a look at Quorum. That's an unlikely place to make a move, but James Walker, his eyes have lit up, and he is going through on the inside. That, though, is going to give him the outside for the left-hander at Murray's. Now, if Bell puts his car in the right position, yes, he, he's more or less done that. Walker had to sort of back out of that car got a bit sideways as a result he's lost momentum and Steve Bell is going to come up to the line to take victory in class F here at Snetterton but James Walker in the end only uh, two tenths of a second behind they've had a very enjoyable race there and you know what I'm not sure James Walker will mind being beaten too much because he's had a good race there with a highly delighted Steve Bell Here are the results then. Alistair Bolton taking the win only by six tenths of a second in the end from Scott Mattel. Cutmore on the last lap got the fastest lap of the race. In seventh place was Duncan Hawler. He lost out in the end to David Whale. Tony Gaunt, Calvin Rawls and Robert Garner completed the top ten. Well, Al, two wins in the day. That's uh, the stuff dreams have made of, isn't it? Yeah, I'm very happy with that. I'd almost given up on the championship after the last, well, four rounds, last few sessions, but you know, two wins today is fantastic, dead chuffed. And this time it was sort of getting the lead from the off, wasn't it? Yeah, I got a good start along with John, I think we were kind of neck and neck. I had a bit of trouble getting into second gear, so we just pulled ahead a tiny bit, just a couple of feet, and as we turned into, um, yeah, whatever the first corner is, it, I think he kind of let me go a little bit, I think he didn't want us to kind of clash, which is very good of him, and then into the second corner, I think he made a mistake, mm -hmm. that let me get a bit of space, yeah. and then I was just telling myself, you know, qualifying laps, don't look in your mirror, <laughs> and that's all I could think of doing, just yeah. be as smooth as possible. So, yeah. so I, mean, I mean, that's good, isn't it, uh, you know, we're getting towards the halfway mark in the season, and now you're thinking, oh, it's sort of getting back on track a little bit. I can't believe it's halfway already, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was down to sixth in the championship, so I'll see what happens after this weekend. So Steve, uh, well, good to see you out in the front engine class that time, but what a great race you had with James. Yeah, absolutely great. All credit to him and Tim Gray. Uh, you know, the car's fantastic. It's very difficult to drive with. I give it 110% just to keep up with him there. And it really was a matter of, you know, our next couple of laps. So I was glad I kept it together and uh, it's a good race. Of course, we didn't see you out in the first race. What happened there? Unfortunately, in qualifying, we got a wheel bearing fairy, uh, failure. Just, you know, one of them things that just happens. And, that was it, it put us out. Uh, we were only literally two, two minutes away from finishing it, but they'd already set off, so we couldn't join in the first race, which was valuable to me because that's points for the championship as well. Well done, Steve. Thank you. Thanks. First of the Protec Shock Sports Specials Championship races was an absolute cracker. Let's see if race two can live up to that. Well, Paul Boyd, Clive Hudson and Paul Collingwood in his Silver J15 were on the podium earlier on today. But it's good to see that Eddie Ives has repaired the damage from race number one. He's back out there on pole position with Clive Hudson next to him. Paul Boyd and Dave Caldercourt on the second row of the grid as the lights go out. And the race gets underway. 
fantastic start once again from Patrick Mortel from row 7. This time it was on the inside of the track, so it was had to actually kind of cross the circuit to find its way clear on the left-hand side of the track. Obviously, it's something he's uh, got quite comfortable with doing that. It's a little trick he's worked out for himself. You can see the uh, Jaguar D-Type replica uh, going through of uh, Tim Fauci, number 69. He's a bit further down the order. It's Caldercourt that's got into the lead of the race, though. From the outside of the second row, he's going to be pretty much alongside Eddie Ives as they head down towards the left-hander at Palmer for the first time of asking in what's going to be uh, a slightly shorter race uh, this time, we think. Over 10 minutes plus one lap, we are on board with Clive Hudson. He's going past Dave Caldercourt, who's already dropped down to second behind Eddie Ives. So Clive Hudson, who led for so much of the first race, is up to second place here behind this Elite Paws, a, a car that has got takes styling cues from the Lotus 7, but is a, a completely new chassis design by uh, Eddie Ives and the team at Elite Motorsport Engineering. A lot of hard work has gone into the design and build of that car. They've been working on it for quite some time. There's been some blood, sweat and not a few tears shed as well as they've developed it, but I think they've now found the right combination of chassis and, and engine and it's gone really well at Brands Hatch and here at Snetton, possibly slightly to Eddie's surprise as we see the uh, Westfield of Gar sorry the Tiger we should say of, uh, of Gary Davidson that was the green car go through but down towards us as they come at Brundle it is Eddie Ives leading then in that elite with the two litre Duratec power plant in second place is uh, Clive Hudson and then there was a gap back to the third position man there is number 51 you can see which is uh, Paul Collingwood just ahead of the uh, green Tiger of Gary Davidson third place at the moment well, I think that's being held by Calder Cup we're going to check on that in a moment we go back on board though with Clive Hudson in the Eclipse he's just behind uh, race leader Eddie Ives Ives who qualified well at Brantash in damp conditions we thought maybe that was a one-off but he did well getting podium finishes and class wins in both of the races there a non-finish in race one here but who knows, he could even get an outright win. We need to watch out for Paul Boyd. He's at a blistering pace in race number one. He's in fourth place at the moment, just behind Dave Caldercourt. Nick Holden, it looked to be in fifth position. Here comes Patrick Mortel uh, with John Moore just behind him. I think John will be very much encouraged by the performance that the FRS Arrow is showing here at uh, Snetterton this weekend. A new car for the 2014 season. So we're on board with uh, Patrick Mortel. That's the 33 car of uh, Steve Dean, who used to race in 750 Motor Club Hot Hatch back in 1995. He also raced in uh, Formula 4 as well, more recently sp uh, switching to uh, kit cars, which is now known as Sport Specials. So on board here with Mortel. Nigel Brown now just ahead of us in number 6. And here is Alan Robson, and somehow all of the MEV MX150Rs, the cars with the Master MX5 running gear, have managed to get themselves together. Now, this to me looks a little bit organised. It looks to me as if they're almost having a, a rolling start amongst themselves at the start of the second lap. If that is the case, then Alan Robson has made quite a nice start there and has got past one of uh, the other MEV, MEV MX150Rs, which I think was that of uh, Mickey Scott in car number 58. But yes, they somehow... I don't think it was coincidence, all found themselves occupying the same piece of tarmac at the beginning of the second lap of the race. And uh, why not? There's uh, about nine of them. Oh, someone's going skating off uh, down towards the old uh, runoff at Sea Corner there. Now that's the Montreal hairpin, of course. And down towards uh, Palmer we go on board once again with Alan Robson, who runs the uh, MX5 racing series that we'll see out uh, in a few weeks' time at Castle Coombe. Already been out at a couple of meetings this season at, uh, at Donington Park and Browns Hatch. Through on the inside there goes the number 50 car with Russell Clark from uh, Seaford down at the Agostini hairpin. And uh, yeah, they're having a bit of fun, aren't they? The drivers of these MEV MX 150Rs. I think that looks like Kevin Dengate and Chris Lovett, who were the quickest drivers in race one. They're at it again as someone goes a little bit wide there, coming out of Hamilton and down towards Oggies. Meanwhile, back in the the main part of the race if you like where you can see uh, that group of cars come through next through is Nigel Brown then it looks like Steve Dean then you've got Patrick Mortel and uh, John Moore in the FRS Arrow and those two cars actually seem to be quite evenly matched although very different in concept one with the Toyota winning gear one with the uh, bits from the Ford Fiesta as uh, contending for the lead of the unofficial uh, MEV MX150R class you've got Dengate and Lovett going at it and then you've got the uh, 
the next couple of cars through, which includes the number 78 car, which is uh, Stuart Much. This is the predominantly white car that you can see there. He's running in third position at the moment, just ahead of number 42, which is uh, Darren Griffin, who's fourth place amongst the uh, Mayor of MX 150Rs that uh, are enjoying their own private battle here. Up towards Murray's then comes the class leader, if you like, that is uh, Kevin Dungate, a stalwart of uh, Mazda MX-5 racing for some time, so uh, is indeed Chris Lovett, number 76. And good to see the Matt enjoy themselves in the in the MX-150Rs. We're on board now with Alan Robson as they come past the pits. You get a bit of a toe in these cars, they're a bit boxy in uh, in their shape. Meanwhile, uh, the head of the field, Eddie Ives, is leading and Clive Hutton is giving him quite a hard time. Actually, there's not too much to choose between the two. He's lapping much faster than even the uh, fastest of the uh, MX 150Rs. They've been doing 2 minute 21s. As here is the battle between number 7, Anton Lathan, who's right behind now, number 11, John Moore, as they come to the bomb hole. This is towards the bottom end of the uh, top ten, this battle at the moment. Patrick Mortel up ahead. Now Paul Boyd is chipping away at the advantage of Clive Hudson here. And this is more or less what he did in the first race, uh, Paul Boyd. He found a lot of speed towards the end of the race, got on terms with Clive Hudson and made a move right towards the end of the race. Hudson just making a bit of a mistake there, I felt, at Montreal. The back of the car stepping out as he exited the corner, tried to get the power back down. I think that's lost him a bit of ground to the race leader, Eddie Ives. And you can see Eddie now making his way past the spectator banking, down towards the left-handed hairpin at Agassiz. Now they're in amongst the back markers now, the slower Mev MX 150Rs. Paul Boyd there in the yellow number three car, taking a lot of time out of Clive Hudson, the fancy, as they went into the hairpin that time. Now through Hamilton they will come the left hand flick, the right hander that tightens up on you a little bit as you go through it is Augies, that's the next corner there's Patrick Mortel another exoskeleton type car different uh, type of idea around the chassis construction, he loses out there to, to John Moore the more conventional bodywork on that car but uh, it's bodywork that looks very smart and sleek indeed I'm sure there'll be uh, more interesting, more cars to be constructed for that. And John certainly has ambitions for the FRS Arrow, which you see ahead of us to have his own one make championship in due course. There's number 51, Paul Collingwood, who was on the podium in the uh, earlier race. And I don't think he's going to be there this time. He's in fourth place at the moment with uh, Dave Caldercourt and Nick Holden, who finished fourth in race one behind him. Now there is the car of number three, which is still in third place, Paul Boyd. The Eclipse SM1 for the drive from Toaster. Both Paul and Clive come from Northamptonshire. And they go now on to their last lap with Eddie Ives a little bit further up the road. He's hoping that he can hold on for just three more miles of this Snetterton layout. Back markers ahead though, are they going to come into play? Well I think Ives did lose some time there lapping John Potter's car. And that's allowed Clive Hudson to get right onto terms with him now. Through the Montreal hairpin they go, and the gap is down to only a couple of car lengths. Good speed carried out of the corner by Hudson. Palmer isn't really an overtaking opportunity though, but get the corner right, you'll carry good speed down the straight into Agostini. He's close enough to pick up a bit of a toe here from Eddie Eyes, but he jinks now to the right-hand side of the circuit, so he's looking to go the long way around Agostini, maybe getting the cut back on the exit to the corner, he'll apex the corner of that a bit later. We'll see how that shakes itself out in a moment as we uh, see this battle further back which involves Mark Bowd in the uh, GT40 replica and a couple of the Sport Specials cars uh, as well as they go on to their final three mile lap of this Snetterton 300 circuit. Well it's still Ives ahead but Hudson now is alongside him as they make their way along the Bentley straight. I think he's used the toe there to get past Eddie Ives and leads into Brundle for the final time. So Clive Hudson on the final lap takes the lead of the race away from the man from Chelmsford in Essex, Eddie Ives. And Ives has got to be careful here not to lose third place as well because Paul Boyd is right behind him now. 
three of them. You could almost throw a pocket handkerchief over them, couldn't you, as they turn their way through Coram. More slower cars up ahead. I'm not sure if they'll catch them, though. So is it going to be Hudson or can Ives fight back or possibly even Paul Boyd? They jink past that back mark who possibly even is going to head into the pit lane. Ives gets a good run out of Moyes. He's in the toe. He dives out of the slipstream now, pulls alongside, but just Clive Hudson holds on by six one hundredths of a second. And Paul Boyd takes third place. And it's going to be a bit of a wait back to the fourth place battle, which is still raging on. Well, Paul Collingwood is going to take fourth, fifth and sixth side by side, though. This time, David Caldicott just gets the better of Nick Holden in a reversal of the fortunes from race one. Well, here are the results then. As I say, just six one hundredths of a second separating first and second. All three cars covered by just over six tenths. Paul Collingwood a further 15 seconds back. This time, the Class B victory. Well, that went to Colin Benham, the reigning champion, getting onto the scoreboard as far as class wins are concerned for this season. Well, Clive, uh, reversal of fortunes this time. You've managed to beat him. Well, yeah, it just kind of went my way, really. It wasn't, it wasn't the plan, but if I had planned it, then following Eddie around, who is really fast around there, mm -hmm. he taught me how to drive around it, and then, uh, and then the back markers worked for me, and I got past him. So, yeah. That was good. I think, as well, we're looking at the lap times. You found a second or so from your earlier race as well. Did you really feel that it was that guidance that Eddie gave you that really helped there? Eddie was a lot of help. This is only the, the 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 second time, which is only today, that I've driven around this the, the longer circuit, mm -hmm. and it is a very technical circuit. You've got to, you've got to get it right, otherwise it costs you. So what's that? Two wins apiece now between you and Paul, I think, isn't it? So uh, looking quite exciting for the championship. It is. It's, it's looking very very promising for Eclipse, certainly. <laughs> so let's let's hope somebody else in a different class isn't stealing all the points. <laughs> okay. Well done, Clive. Eddie Ives, uh, second position for you, having led the early part of the race. Yeah, it's a great race. Um, a bit of a shame early on in race one, um, doing quite well, and then having a wheel arch break. And we had a wheel arch break in the second race, but we managed to cruise at home. But uh, yeah, fantastic race for the Eclipse boys. Um, no one no one put a foot wrong, so um, yeah. Cl Clive reckons that he was sort of following you around and sort of learning the lines here. Yeah, we, we, we've done a fair bit of testing here, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll see going into Rockingham. Second race of the day for the bike sports. It's the final race of the weekend. Tim Gray is on pole position once again with this grid set by the second fastest time set in a qualifying session which was combined with that for the RGB cars. Red lights go on and the Spire Sports Cars Bike Sports Championship race is underway. It's not quite underway for Kelvin Kingsley though from towards the back of the grid. Finally he does get going. It's Tim Gray that leads a good start there by Adrian Reynard from the uh, third driver of the grid in actual fact, wonderful start from the driver of the SR3. He's up into second position then behind Tim Gray. Looks like Will Brown there in third place. Richard Wise is fourth. It's side by side for fifth position. I think that might just be Tim Porter that is squeezing through in fifth place. And of course the uh, man playing catch up right at the back of the field is Kelvin Kingsley after he failed to get off the line. The field coming out of Palmer now. There's that uh, orange radical SR4 which we were looking out for in the first race but we didn't quite see that's Oliver Cox the only SR4 in the race one of the older uh, of the radical designs now there goes the leader Tim Gray though and up to second has gone uh, Will Brown because a mistake I think has been made by Adrian Reynard he's dropped back down to fourth position Richard Wise now has gone through into third spot in his car number uh, 88 for the man from Hemel Hempstead Reynard then is fourth in number 29 heads on to the Bentley straight with a little bit of work to do then if he's going to get back into uh, contention for a podium finish here great is starting as he uh, went on really in the first race which he won by nearly half a minute He'll have his uh, work cut out to try and do it again it's going to be a slightly shorter uh, race I think this time because time is pressing towards the end of the day here at Snetterton but uh, no doubt he will pull out and uh, have a good win it was dominant in the end at uh, Silverstone in the last two rounds of the championship after John Paul Ivey won rounds one and two at Donington Park Grey won both of them at Silverstone which I think dispirited JP a little bit 
Uh, difference really between Donington and Silverton for Tim Gray was a more work on the development of that car, which is a new car for this season, but also getting what he thought originally was the compound of tyres that he already had on the car when uh, Dunlop delivered some new tyres. And when he did turn around the performance of the car, gave him a lot more grip. And so Tim Gray uh, from Silverstone onwards has been uh, in fine form. There he is, turning his way into Brundle and Nelson. Will Brown in second place. Richard Wise in third place. That's a very heartening performance for Richard Wise, who came from the RGB ranks. Does have one or two drivers on this grid, including Tim Gray. And uh, also we talked about Doug Carter a little bit earlier on. There is the Doug Scanlon car, number 16. And Oliver Cox is going very well in that number 57 Radical SR4. The man from... Uh, Nottingham is ahead of Elliot Goodman who was a podium finisher of course in race number one now Goodman didn't make a very good start at all has dropped back down the order and he's finding it tough going to try trying to find his way back up through the field he's got the likes of Oliver Cox to uh, try and find his way past during the course of this race uh, Bob Scanlon in there as well of course as they make their way across the line then to complete another lap of this Sneston 300 circuit And there is Scanlon. We've got the uh, various blue and orange coloured cars involved in this scrap as well. It's a very colourful battle, if, uh, if nothing else. We've got the 77 car of Baxter, then you've got the 50 car of uh, Doug Carter. In the first race, all 15 cars that took the start made it to the end. We had a non starter for James Brakel in race one. He's been joined on the non starters this by Mike Simpson, I'm afraid, for race two. So just the 14 starters uh, for this occasion in the Spy Sports Cars Bike Sports Championship as we watch Oliver Cox come through, defending from Elliot Goodman. And then Gary Baxter just behind in the 77 car, which is uh, one of the SR3s, 1.5 litre cars. All of these cars by the nature of the championship are motorcycle engines. They run in four classes, although we've not seen any representation for Class D this season. The up to 1,000cc class, which might pick up the lights of uh, some of the uh, Global GT lights and that type of car. But we've not really seen many out in, in this class for a couple of seasons, which is a shame. So Oliver Cox still heading this little gaggle through Brundle and Nelson this time. He's getting very well indeed. He's been racing with the bike sports now for quite a few seasons. Finding it difficult going in Class B uh, these days, of course, because the Radical PR6 is really the cars to have. They just about squeeze into the uh, Class B. Have the uh, centralised driving position, of course, the uh, Radical PR6 which is proving pretty popular these days. Just behind him there is the number 28 car, which is uh, Goodman, of course. And he's in one of the SR3s. And there's 33, which is uh, Richard Hardy from Abingdon in Oxfordshire. Another driver that's a very staunch supporter of this Bike Sports Championship. As we watch Kelvin Kingsley closing in on the number 38 car now which is Gary Patterson Richard Hardy's uh, teammate they turn up to races together as we look at number 50 Doug Carter in the blue and orange PR6 this was uh, a new car for Doug for last season but it's not going well I'm afraid his hands in the air he's out of the race and a moment to put Montreal or well, another one as he tries to recover for Richard Hardy I'm afraid he does uh, continue now though as we watch Oliver Cox who continues to keep Elliot Goodman behind him this is impressive stuff in the early race Elliot Goodman did 1 minute 56s on his way to his best lap of the race and he's been in the 156s again here his laps are actually slightly quicker than Oliver Cox but Cox has defended well and Goodman despite being on the podium early on has not been able to find a way through we've just seen the last lap board go out and we can see that Tim Gray is well on his way to another victory. This will be the fourth in the row. As far as the championship was concerned, it was Jean-Paul Ivy that was leading coming into this weekend, but JP 
as Tim mentioned, unfortunately not here this weekend. So this rather plays into the hands of Tim Gray, who was two points behind in the Class B Championship standings, despite the fact that he didn't have a particularly happy Donington Park. Didn't feature on the overall podium in either of the races there, or indeed get the uh, class victories, but it was a different story at Silverstone. And uh, this Spire for Paul Nightingale team is going very well indeed. You can see the delight on the pit wall for the Spire and Tim Gray Motorsport team as Tim takes win number four out of six races this season in the Spire Sports Cars Bike Sports Championship. Well, let's have a final look at the results then. Tim Gray winning this time by just a shade over 16 seconds from Will Brown. A great third place finish for Richard Wise. Tim Gray getting the lap record as well further back. Well, Elliot Goodman couldn't find his way past Oliver Cox, who got a great top six finish. Bob Scanlon, Gary Patterson, Kelvin Kingsley, they all completed the top ten. OK, Tim, uh, the end to a pretty much perfect day, I would think, as far as the bike sports is concerned for you. Yeah, fantastic day. Really good day. Um, all the cars have performed absolutely flawlessly. Mm -hmm. um, second race, again, same sort of theory as the first race. Mm -hmm. Worked out a treat. Absolutely, and good as well to see not, not just one spar on the podium this time, but two. Absolutely fantastic. I'm so pleased for Richard. He's been, been getting quicker and quicker. Um, we came here testing last week and he was really well on the pace. And so to get for him to get a podium today is, is brilliant. Absolutely. And as far as you're concerned, next round of the championship is going to be, what, Rockingham, I think? Yeah, Rockingham next. Um, I can't wait. We got on quite well at Rockingham last year, but we, we, we struggled as well. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, sort of put the, the bad result, but the good performance and put a, a good result and a good performance. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. OK, well, two second places at Snetterton, that must be a good day for you. Absolutely, yeah, it's um, sort of my best best result of the year. Um, very happy with that, qualifying was was good, um, and then sort of managed to convert that into two seconds, so very, very happy, yeah. Absolutely, so is this going to be the sign of things to come? We're going to see more of you in the, oh, on the podium so. positions? We hope so, yeah. I mean, if we can get some more testing done before the next races, that'd be good. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes, but hopefully, yeah, fingers crossed. So Richard, you must be really pleased to be on the overall podium as well as get a class win. I'm really, really happy and uh, this is my first overall podium um, ever, I think, mm -hmm. in bike sports. And to achieve it in a little 1,000cc against some of the big engines mm -hmm. has been just great. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said to you before, it's the, the Tim Gray Spire is just an amazing car to drive. So if a 50-something like me can do it, <laughs> loads of other people can. So it's been a wonderful day, really good. Well, that's all from Snetterton. The next meeting is at Castle Coombe, where we'll see Stock Hatch, Classic Stock Hatch, Formula V, NMX5s. See you then. Bye for now.